Hello. How is everybody doing tonight? My name is Pastor Susan Cousineau, and it is July 7th, and I am so excited to be coming to you tonight. I have a very special message that I believe is from the Lord for you, and I also believe it's going to give you some great hope and some help and some clarity, actually, about what God is doing in this hour, what um, he's calling us to do, and um, also what in the world is happening. So would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I ask for your presence to come. Lord, it's your presence and your anointing that allows us to understand your word, to hear your voice, God, and then also to obey what you are asking us to do. Jesus, I pray that you would anoint my words, but also anoint the ears and the hearts that hear. I declare that Satan is bound from every hindrance from this teaching tonight, in Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. I would like to preface my teaching and just talk really plainly to you tonight about being led by the Holy Spirit and the need for obedience. Now, before you turn me off, I wanna state as strongly as I can that all condemnation and any religious spirit is never from God. These teachings and my heart are not tips and techniques. They're not do's and don'ts. They're not just follow this plan and you will receive your blessings from God. I don't believe that's the way that God works. I think that's man's way of putting restrictions and rules on the unconditional love of God. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't have principles. He has given us his word and very clearly states in the Bible his divine ways of living for us to follow. If we adhere to those, if we listen and obey, that leads us to the blessings that God desires to give us. It's the same way that parents work with their children, right? Now, when you hear something that God is calling you to do or you look around, I mean, some personalities like mine, it's like, I want to do everything perfectly. I just need to do everything and make sure I do it right. And then others of you are on the opposite spectrum that says, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter what I do or don't do because God loves me unreservedly. Well, this is definitely a true statement that God does love us fully, unconditionally, and always. But there are plans and purposes he created us for. And listening to his voice, the Holy Spirit within us, and choosing to follow him and obey leads us to the fullness of our life in Christ and also the abundant life that Jesus died to give us. He said he came to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. The other thing I wanna remind us tonight is our lives are not just about us. You were created to love God and to love people. In Romans 11, 29, this is in the New Century Version, it says, God never changes his mind about the people he calls or the things he gives them. Maybe you've heard it, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. In the message translation, God's gifts and God's call are under full warranty, never canceled, never rescinded. It's pretty important, I think. A lot of times we think, well, you know, I'm far away from God or I've sinned or I've really blown it here. And so he, he obviously doesn't want to use me now. That's not true. He never cancels and never rescinds the gifts and callings that he gives you. God gives us certain talents when we're born and certain gifts when we're born again, but we have the final say if we will embrace, utilize, and walk in what we've been given. I like this quote by Tony Dungy. He's a former professional American football player and a coach in the National Football League. Dungy was the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers from 1996 to 2001 and the head coach of the Indianapolis Colts from 2002 to 2008. 
Dungy became the first black head coach to win the Super Bowl when his Colts defeated the Chicago Bears in Super Bowl 41. Dungy set a new NFL record for consecutive playoff appearances by a head coach in 2008 after securing his 10th straight playoff appearance with a win against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Those facts are from Wikipedia. Dungy states, one of the most important things I have learned along the way is having the courage to stand by my convictions. The teaching tonight in your journey, this is number five, is about doing just that. I call it obedience. In the Passion Translation, we read, by the way, if you haven't read anything in the Passion Translation, I encourage you to. It just shows the passionate way of God loving us. Verse 16, don't you realize that grace frees you to choose your own master? But choose carefully, for who you surrender yourself to become, you become a servant. You are bound to the one you choose to obey. If you choose to love sin, it will become your master and it will own you and reward you with death. But if you choose to love and obey God, he will lead you into perfect righteousness. That's Romans 6, 16. You are going to serve somebody. So I ask you tonight, why not have it be God? I think we have got to come to this final conclusion. God's plans are the very best for us. They are the ones that will bring us the greatest fulfillment and the greatest amount of joy. I just want to challenge you, settle it once and for all. Bob Dylan, he was born in Duluth, Minnesota. He is an American singer, songwriter, author, and a visual artist who's been a major figure in pop culture for more than 50 years. He wrote a song, Gotta Serve Somebody, and it's very well known with the lyrics. Listen to some of these. You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You might be the heavyweight champion of the world. You might be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You might be a rock and roll addict prancing on the stage. You might have drugs at your command, women in a cage. You may be a businessman or some high degree thief. They may call you doctor or they may call you chief. You may be a state trooper. You might be a young Turk. You may be the head of some big TV network. You may be rich or poor. You may be blind or lame. You may be living in another country under another name but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're gonna have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're gonna have to serve somebody. Obedience needs to become a lifestyle for us. It can't be like cafeteria style Christianity. Well, I want, I want to do some of this over here, but gosh, I don't think I want to do any of that, right? Obedience starts out as one small step. For me, I believe it starts when you first sense that God wants you to do something. Sometimes it's just that little nudge or it's like maybe a little thought that comes into your mind. Usually it's really not very loud, you know, it's just kind of an idea that comes into your mind. It can be the Holy Spirit though. Could be something really simple. A lot of times it usually is like, Sue, grab your umbrella before you go to work today. But in your mind, you argue. Well, the forecast was sunny all day. Remember what the Word of God says about our minds? In Romans 8, 7, in the Amplified, the mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God or at enmity against God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. The mind of the flesh is the carnal mind, which means it is not renewed by the word of God. So something will come into our mind and then we kind of rationalize it away. And you got to remember, you can't trust your mind most of the time. As Christ followers, we are to be led by the Holy Spirit, never our mind. So 
You leave your umbrella by the door. You talk yourself out of it. But as your day progresses, your boss decides to take you to lunch. Now this is a really big deal. You had complimented her on her new sharp suit. She stated, I love it, except when it gets wet. The water spots almost stain it. You go outside your office building to go to lunch and it is pouring rain. If you had obeyed that little thought and grabbed your umbrella, you could have offered it to your boss instead of dashing to the car getting soaked. Her attitude had definitely changed, which negatively affected your time together. I mean, really, was it that big a deal just to grab your umbrella? Probably waste more time arguing yourself out of it. Usually, as God is teaching us obedience, it is always for our good. Sometimes we don't understand why, like maybe you would have grabbed your umbrella and you wouldn't have needed it all day. Who knows? But that is how we learn step by step. One personal example, and I would have many, one day when my kids were little, we were all going on an outing and I felt like my thoughts came into my mind, I better bring some extra clothes. And you probably know what happened because I didn't bring extra clothes. Mud puddle fun, a leaky, very poopy diaper, you get the picture. Instead, I had to make a Walmart run, which is never easy or quick, with several children in tow, plus having to spend the grocery money for clothes when I had lots of them at home. I chose not to heed that inner voice. Oops. As life goes on, we begin to understand God really is on our side and he has our back. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And we know about the foolish man who did not listen to the words and put them into practice, what happened to his house. Let me ask you, when you hear the word of God preached or you read your Bible or a devotional, you see a cool Facebook post about God or a song on K-Love, do you let those just be, oh, nice words? Or you think, gosh, that's kind of a cool message and you just kind of go about your day? Or do you try and act on or put into practice the message of those words? Jesus said when we apply what we have heard in our life. In our everyday way of life, our daily walk, we add stability. Just like building a house, it goes one block at a time, then one board at a time, step by step. Question, does obedience always look like we win? No, it definitely does not. When the nation of Israel entered the promised land at God's direction, they had to face strong enemy opposition. I don't think God ever keeps our lives free from trouble and conflict. If he did, we wouldn't have any reason to depend on him, right? He allows enough difficulty to keep us turned toward him and tuned in to his voice. If I felt God telling me to do something and I obeyed, if there were problems or opposition in the midst of that obedience, especially when I first started walking with God, I think, oh, I must have blown it. I must have made a mistake. I must not have heard God right. It was really difficult for me until I was taught and learned that obedience and our life as a Christ follower is always opposed. God has a plan for your life, but so does Satan. In Jeremiah 21, 29, 11, we know this familiar scripture, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. But Satan's plan in Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can make your stand against the devil's schemes. Another word for schemes are strategies or wilds. And the word translated wiles means with a road. God has a plan, but Satan also has a plan. So which one would you rather follow? I think there's really only two roads, you know. We think, well, I'm quite not ready to go God's way yet, but 
gosh, I really don't want to go Satan's way. So I'm just going to kind of go my own way. You know, the old song, I did it my way. There's really only two ways, though, really. Another question. Does obedience sometimes seem illogical or even maybe crazy? Let me give you some examples of crazy. In the first book of the Bible, in Genesis, we hear about Noah. Noah was a righteous person who followed God and obeyed him in a world where everybody else was being disobedient. Noah was able to stand for righteousness in the midst of a wicked and corrupt culture. Now, try to put yourself in Noah's place or in Mrs. Noah's place. How do you think you would feel being married to someone who was building a boat the size of one and a half football fields? Would you be thrilled to know that your husband stood for righteousness and obedience or would you wish he just sort of fit in and was kind of normal? I cannot imagine the type of opposition and the brunt of every joke all the while he was building that boat. But you know what? Noah determined to obey God. He heard God and he was determined to obey. And we don't know if God cheered him on every day or if he just heard it one time and then it took him years and years to finish his project. But no matter what hostility he received, he refused to blend in with the world systems. Hebrews 11, 7 in the Passion Translation says, Faith opened Noah's heart to receive revelation and warnings from God about what was coming, even things that had never been seen. But he stepped out in reverent obedience to God and built an ark that would save him and his family. By his faith, the world was condemned, but Noah received God's gift of righteousness that comes by believing or obeying. How about when Jesus' disciples ask him, what would the world be like before he returns? And this is his answer in Matthew 24. Concerning that day and, and exact hour, no one knows when it will arrive, not even the angels of heaven, only the Father knows. For it will be exactly like it was in the days of Noah, when the Son of Man appears. Before the flood, the flood people lived in their lives, eating, drinking, marrying, having children, they did not realize that the end was near until Noah entered the ark and then suddenly the flood came and took them all away in judgment. It will happen the same way when the Son of Man appears. These are interesting days we're living in, isn't it? Your assignments from God, which of course require your obedience, may save the lives of many other people and you may never know the full consequences or results of your obedience or your disobedience. How about Joshua and the battle against the hostile enemy city of Jericho? In the book of Joshua, it opens with the children of Israel standing at the Jordan River for the second time in 40 years. Remember the first time they came up to the promised land? Moses had led them out of their bondage to the land promised to them by God. But when they saw the giants and the problems, they chose to turn and walk away. They saw the beautiful fruits, the great abundance of food and water, but they refused to obey and they wound up wandering in the desert for 40 years. Joshua was now their leader and the, their first battle was against the city of Jericho, which had high walls protecting it. Joshua received the plan of attack. I'm sure it must have sounded crazy to him. The way to fight was to send the soldiers of Israel marching around Jericho one time a day for the next six days. The priests were to go behind the soldiers blowing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Covenant. Then on the seventh day, the Israelites were to go around the city seven times while the priests blew their trumpets. At the completion of this, they were to make a long, loud blast with their trumpets, and all the people were to shout as loud as they could. Now, this was a pretty crazy battle plan. But what were the results of their obedience? The huge, high city walls fell down flat. The soldiers went in and destroyed their enemies, and again, they only took what God told them to, to take in the spoils, 
And this was the beginning of a totally new way of life for the people of God. They had to learn how to be led by God, and then they would see his amazing provisions because of it. I love this other story. I mean, there's so many stories in the Bible about strange obedience, but this is King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20. He had a huge army coming to fight them. They said it was more than the sand on the seashore. They couldn't even see the end of the, of the army against them. So he calls the people of Israel together to fast and pray. He says in verse 12, For we have no power against this great multitude, God, that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. So then God gives Jehoshaphat the strategy through his prophet. You will not need to fight this battle, God said. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 20, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord. Yep, sing. And who should praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and they were saying and singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, if I was a singer and I was one of those going out with no weapons and facing a huge army, I think I would be a bit intimidated and pretty darn scared. But I guess that's how we build our faith, right? Verse 22, now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Amazing. They never had to fight. They just praised. In the New Testament, in Luke 5, the disciples who were fishermen by trade, in other words, they knew their stuff. They had fished all night and caught nothing. Jesus had just finished up his teaching and he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word... I think that's a key phrase. I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Why did God ask them and many others and also ask us to do these unusual acts of obedience? I think it's to get us out of our head, for one thing, and to keep us from trying to figure it all out. And also, God gets the credit, and we do never boast of our abilities. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, the people of Israel asked God for a king so they could be like all the other nations around them. This greatly grieved God and also the current prophet and judge, Samuel, this meant that the people wanted a king to rule them instead of God. Israel's great distinction was that they were not like any of the other nations. Saul, from the tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest of the tribes of, of Israel, was chosen to be king. So Samuel said, What happened, though, is that Saul, even though he at first started out to be very humble, he disobeyed God. God had given him a specific assignment through the prophet um, Samuel, and he partially obeyed. And so this is what, ha this is what God said then to, to King Saul through Samuel. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow. Disobedience here is called rebellion and in the same category as witchcraft. 
The consequences of King Saul's disobedience cost him the loss of God's blessing. He failed to establish a lasting empire, and he and his sons both died in battle against Israel's armies. God desires our complete obedience, not just partial. We can do a lot of religious activities or even goodwill or humanitarian things, and I'm not saying that, that these are bad things, and they might be what God's calling you to do. But if it is not exactly what God wants you to do, it's just going to take up your time and it's not going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. Me personally, I used to look around and think every opportunity, every idea that presented itself to me, that's what I needed to do or that's what I should do. And you know, should can be a dirty word. This result resulted in my exhaustion and much frustration almost every time. I have partially learned, still learning of course, that I only have to do the things that God calls me or tells me to do, nothing else. It gives me a lot more freedom. I don't have to look at every single need and meet every single one of them around me. Nations that have a king ruling over them, even in this day, they are very different, like America, which is a democracy. When the monarch or the ruler makes a law or a decision, maybe it's legislative, judicial, or an executive decision, the people need to obey. And they know that they cannot come against the authority of the king. But in our democracy, which is a type of governance run by the people or directly or indirectly run by the people, it's based on equality and freedom. But basically what the king says goes, it requires that he demands compliance. I really think that's why many of us as American Christians struggle with the kingdom of God. We don't understand that Jesus is the king. We don't understand that what he says to us is non-negotiable. I mean, really, is obedience something that we can choose to do or not do? Well, it is, but there are consequences. Obedience is not always easy. It can be very challenging, especially when we feel tempted to believe that we stand to lose more than we might gain. Thoughts might go through our minds, like, will obeying God cost me more than disobeying him? Can I experience greater happiness by committing this sin than I would be by obeying God? What will other people think? How will this affect my time right now? Could I do this later? Or if I put it off, maybe God will find somebody else to do it. I'm sure somebody else is more qualified than me. In Deuteronomy 26, 16 through 18, God calls his people a special people, a chosen people. In, in 16, this day, the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments, and that you will obey his voice. Also today, the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people, just as he promised you that you should keep all of his commandments. Today is your day. The definition of obey is to listen, to hear with the intention of compliance. And I'm gonna give you an acronym of OBEY. O does stand for obedience. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And in John 15, 14, Jesus said, you show that you are my intimate friends when you obey all that I command you. I mean, really think about how God has hand chosen us to be his specific children of God. It's really incredible when you think about it. Luke 6, 46, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? B in the word obey stand for blessings. So 
Did you answer the question, is obedience optional? I think everything's optional, right? In Deuteronomy 28, in 1 through 10, in the New Living Translation, <clears throat> the title of this is Blessings for Obedience. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks will be blessed. Your fruit baskets and breadboards will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, you will be blessed. The Lord will conquer your enemies when they attack you. They will attack you from one direction, but they will scatter you in seven. The Lord will guarantee a blessing on everything you do and will fill your storehouses with grain. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. If you obey the commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, the Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he swore he would do. Then all the nations of the world will see that you are a people claimed by the Lord and they will stand in awe of you. This isn't just for the children of Israel. If you re remember in Romans, he has allowed us to be grafted in. And so we are also a part of the church in general, his chosen called out ones. In Deuteronomy, there are 14 verses stating the blessings of obedience. But in that same chapter, he goes on to say there are, and there are 52 verses with the terrible results of disobedience. In Joshua 1, 7 through 9 in the New Living Translation, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The E in the acronym for obey is evangelism. Obedience requires sharing the gospel or the good news about Jesus. But did you immediately get a picture of knocking on doors, handing out little white tracks, or standing on a street corner somewhere with your Bible in hand? I don't think that's what... Jesus met when he talked about evangelism. Evangelism is a lifestyle. It's basically just caring about people. Loving God enables us to love people. This has really been strongly on my heart and I think you've heard it every time that I've talked to you is that until we understand how much we are loved, until we receive the grace and the amazing forgiveness and the love that God has for us, totally unconditional, then we can only give that away to people. We cannot give something that we have not received. We have to be people that walk in grace for ourselves. We can't have a higher standard for somebody else than we do for ourselves. This definition of grace is we are loved even though we're not perfect. And you know, we're never gonna be perfect. And I think sometimes we judge our own hearts and our own motives and you know, only God can be the one who does that. Grace is the peace of God given to the restless. It is the unmerited favor of God. We have got to get God's heart, especially in this time we're living in. We have to know how much he cares for us. And it definitely is not just because of the circumstances that we're in. People are in really difficult circumstances right now. And you know, at the end of our life, or even at the end of the day, the only thing that really matters is how much do we love? Do we love God? And do we really love people? I tell you, I pray on a regular basis, and I have for several years, because loving people did not come naturally to me. I used to laugh at God and say, you put me in ministry? I don't even really like these people. 
and he and he just has changed my heart. He's put people around me, my late husband for one, who just loved me unconditionally, and that broke down the walls of the pain that I had incur incurred in my life. I pray Romans 5.5. 5. It says, the love of God is poured into my heart by the Holy Spirit. And God is teaching me how to love. I have to love myself first. I was my hardest, most harshest critic, and I bet you are too. When we have God's heart, then we can share and care about others. And that's what evangelism means. That's like when you go to Aldi, maybe um, you give somebody your cart or they forgot their quarter, right? Or maybe you have an extra bag and they forgot theirs. Maybe it's you come to a stop sign and you just smile at somebody standing there. It's not always a big thing, you know? Second Corinthians 5.20 in the New Living says, we are Christ's ambassadors or representatives. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. In the Passion Translation, it says, we are ambassadors of the anointed one who carry the message of Christ to the world as though God were tenderly pleading with them directly through our lips. So we tenderly plead with you on Christ's behalf, turn back to God and be reconciled to him. We know that Jesus is the answer for every question and for every need. We know that it's been religion and Satan and our unrenewed minds that have beat people over the head and ourselves with condemnation, with do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. And that is not God's way of evangelizing. When we understand that he includes us, that he thinks about us more in one day than all the sand on all the seashores in the entire world, when we know that he rejoices over us with singing, that is when our hearts begin to change. And that's when we can look at other people differently. I ask you, why don't you say to God, show me how you see me, God. And I think you're going to see that he smiles at you. We may never get an assignment from God. We may never get one like, um, the fishermen or Jehoshaphat or Joshua or Noah, we might not get anything like that. We may never be like Mother Teresa or John the Baptist. It could be that we just show consideration and kindness to the people in our lives. Actually, that's a huge mission field, don't you agree? Do you know that when you share your faith with others, you get a greater revelation of all that Jesus has done for you? Isn't that amazing? It's true. Listen to this in Philemon 6. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. And in the New Living Translation, Philemon 6 says, And I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things you have in Christ. The more we receive, the more we understand how blessed we are. Then that is what we can give to others. And that gives us a greater understanding of our position. We're seated in the heavenly realms and we have already gotten everything given to us that pertains to life and godliness. Sometimes sharing our faith is not with words at all. It's maybe our resources. It might be just showing love in action. And I think people many times have really thrown the baby out with the bath. You know, they've thrown out Jesus because of the religiosity and traditions and legalism of the church. And that is not God. The why for the acronym OBEY stands for obedience or yield, yielding our life. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, purchased with the preciousness and paid for, made his own. You were bought with the amazing price of the blood of Jesus Christ. So your life is no longer your own to live it any way that you want. 
And I would say there is a cost to being a follower of Jesus Christ. In Luke 9, 23 through 25, and I think this should be Christianity 101 myself. Then Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross daily, daily, and follow me. If you try and hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed? People of true faith have always grown into the willingness to subordinate their self-will to God's will. Jesus is always our example of radical obedience. He was a radical guy, wasn't he? I mean, I think about sometimes we look at Jesus and then we try and make a tradition about what he did. Remember the time when he spit in the mud and made, um, or spit in the dirt and made mud and then he rubbed the mud into the blind guy's eyes? I was thinking, you know, that pro somebody probably wanted to start a church with, um, you know, this is the way that we do healing. You know, we do it the same way Jesus did. We, we spit in the mud and if you, if you need healing, that's what we're going to do for you. That, I mean, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Really, when you think about it? Listen to this. Jesus in, is described in Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Wow. In this way, God qualified him as a perfect high priest and he became the source of eternal salvation for all those who obey him. In John 12, 27 and 28, Jesus says, Now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason that I came. Father, bring glory to your name. God has created your life with talents, and he's given you gifts and abilities to bring glory to God. It's amazing when you think about it. Christianity is not a religion. It's a lifestyle. It's a following of the one true God, Jesus Christ. He is our, our best friend, and he makes our life an adventure. I mean, to think about that he has already prepared good works for you to walk in. I mean, it's like who wants to just be bored with life? I mean, it used to be, well, you know, you get through high school and then maybe you, you went to the army or you went to college or you learned a trade and then you bought a house and you had 2.5 children and you had a two-car garage. I mean, what is so exciting about that? I mean, it is an adventure. It is an amazing way to serve God, but it requires us to hear his voice and then step out in obedience. And the baby steps will lead to greater ability to obey. So here's the thing, if we have disobeyed, if we've gotten way far away from God, how do we get reestablished to him again? I would say, first of all, recognize that disobedience is not optional and it is sin. I mean, obedience, it's not optional. If Jesus is Lord of our life, if he is the king, then we need to do what he says. And we need to trust that it is the very best for us and for many others. Sin separates us from God. And that's why God hates it. God is not just a permissive parent. God is holy. So repentance is something that we need to do on a regular basis because we drift away. We make mistakes. So repentance or turning around restores God's presence to our lives. You know, that is one thing that separates us from all the other people in the world is the presence of God that's with us. And you can tell somebody who loves Jesus, it's almost like, gosh, I kind of want to hang around them, right? And I'm sure you have people that are drawn to you as well. They may not even know what it is. It's the presence of God and that's what they are thirsty for. If we are far away from God, it's not because God moved, it's because we did. God's word says in Hebrews 13, five, for he has said, I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake you or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. 
God is never going to lose his grip on us. He never goes away from us. He always loves us and he always will. In Joshua 1, 7 through 9 in the New Living, he says, be strong and very courageous. I think this is a word for us again. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study the book of instruction, meditate on it, obey everything written in it, then you will prosper. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Deuteronomy 30, 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. In verse 19, I call heaven and earth as witnesses to you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And then he gives us a hint, right? Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and your length of days. You know, your obedience today could affect your family, people that haven't even been born yet. You have no idea. And you may never understand why God asks you to do some random thing or maybe some huge thing. You may never know till you get to heaven how your obedience is critical to God's plans and purposes because he chose it that way. He created us so that we would know him, love him, and serve him. That's his plan. He could just, I mean, he's so powerful, right? He's God. He could just zap things and cause things to happen, but he chooses a relationship with us as his beloved creation so that we can enjoy his presence, so that we can live out this amazing adventure called being a Christ follower. So my recommendations of things that I have learned is trust God with your life and everything that concerns you. Put it all in his hands. Wait on the Lord for an answer to your problem or situation. Don't just run ahead and try and figure it all out by yourself. Do you see my flat head? My forehead's kind of flat from running into a lot of walls that way. Meditate on God's word. That is, think about something that God has said to you in his word. You know how the word will jump out at you or a song, lyrics or something? then this mull it over in your mind over and over. That's what meditation is. It's not this real weird thing where we have to go into our closet or you know lock our kids away for a while. It's just mulling over and over in, in our mind. What does God say? That's saturating your mind with the word of God so you get his viewpoint. And then when temptation comes, you listen to that internal voice and you get that check in your spirit. And that way you can decide, ah, I don't think I'm going to do that, but I think this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, the thing is, you know, it's not just rules that we follow. It's following the Holy Spirit and his voice within us, right? It's, it's being led by the Spirit. That's what sons of God are. And so we have to figure it out sometimes. We say, gosh, I think that was God, you know? So the other thing to do is then get advice from others, especially if you're gonna do something like buy a new house or move to another country. It's probably good to, um, to take Proverbs eleven fourteen. It says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. I mean, I wouldn't you know, call up somebody on the phone and say, gosh, do you think I should buy oranges or bananas today? No. I don't think I would do that. But if I had a major decision, especially since now I'm a widow, I would talk to a few people about it. People who hear from God or have them pray with you until you get confirmation. I believe God wants you to know his will even more than you want to know it. Because it's for your best. It's for your good. It's for your enjoyment and pleasure. And it's also for his glory and for the salvation or the restoration of many other people. You are important. What God asks you to do is significant and it's not optional, especially in this hour. Listen, obey. It gets easier. If you do not sense a clear direction, 
from the Holy Spirit? You know, ask God to confirm it to you somehow in his word. Or maybe you want to try what Gideon did, you know, try a wet or dry wool fleece from a sheep. Maybe that would work. But, you know, God will never contradict his word. I just sense the incredible love that God has for us as his children in this hour. I mean, we know that we're in the final days. I mean, we don't know how close we are, but we're closer than we were yesterday, right? And to think that God has chosen you and handpicked you to be in this time of history with specific things for you to do. It's not even an accident where you live or where you go to the store, where you get gas. All of those things are a part of his plan and they influence the people that you are around. It's amazing. I wanna pray for you now. And I want you just to, in your heart, clear out any junk that's in there. Oh gosh, I haven't obeyed. I've been far away. Maybe I've disobeyed. You know, it's God isn't up there surprised, right? He's not up there wringing his hands, <clears throat> all worried that you're not gonna, gonna be okay. You're gonna be okay. So why don't we start with this prayer together? Jesus, I ask that you would forgive me. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have walked away from you, when we either felt like it wasn't the right thing to do or it didn't really matter, or maybe it was deliberate disobedience. God, forgive us. Cleanse our hearts, Lord. I ask, God, that you would pour your love into our hearts because so many of us have wounded hearts, Jesus, broken hearts, people that have hurt us, and usually it's the people closest to us who have hurt us the most. Lord, the circumstances around us are scary. We don't understand exactly what's happening. I believe the, there's an increase of pressure because Satan knows that his time is short. But Lord, help us to be raised up above our circumstances. Help us to get back to hearing your voice clearly. Even the baby steps of grabbing an umbrella or extra clothes as we run out the door. Lord, help us to understand that we walk with you, but you are leading us. You are our guide. You are our protector, our provider, and you certainly are our comforter. I pray you would hedge us in by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, your angels would be loose to minister to every single heir of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that you would put it within our mind and within our heart that we are needed desperately in this hour and that you have specific assignments for us to do. Help us, Lord, to obey you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You are so loved by God, and you have incredible things that nobody else can do. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I wanted to remind you that my other teachings are all on my Facebook page. And the handouts are all available on my website, which is thewisewarrior.org. Thanks so much.